Well, good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to be with you. I want to ask you to grab a Bible and open with me to Mark chapter 15. That's our text for this morning. And as you turn there, on the occasion of his death, the death of his majesty, King George V, on the night of January 20th, 1936. The organization of the British Broadcasting Corporation was utilized in communicating the official bulletins to the entire British Empire. From England to Canada to South Africa to Persia to India to Australia, throughout the known world, across the entire globe, from 9.30 p.m. onwards, the ordinary broadcasting programs were stopped. And all of the stations of the BBC, including those conducting shortwave empire service, were linked together, but were kept silent, except for the transmission of the official bulletin at 15-minute intervals. At 10 o'clock, a short service of recollection and prayer for the king was broadcast after which the silent watch between bulletins was resumed. And the final announcement of the peaceful death of the king came shortly after midnight. And in this way, the great organization of the BBC used in the manner of a gigantic public address system with literally millions upon millions of listeners in all parts of the world constituting the audience. And as a result, all of the listeners were able to share with the royal family in the tense anxiety of the last few hours and to receive simultaneously the news of the passing of the sovereign. Never before in the history of the world has it been made possible for the whole human race to unite in sympathetic response to the messages thus conveyed from Sangrenum to listeners everywhere. And one, as one writer conveyed, truly their sound is gone out into all of the lands and their words unto the ends of the earth. And the heart of man cannot fail to be touched by this great achievement of science. The imagination of a poet like Rudyard Kipling might well have been stirred by this theme of the waves of emotion encompass, encompassing the entire earth to trace the changes which history has seen in its methods of proclaiming to the nation the loss of its beloved king. That was written later that year in 1936. The announcement of the death of King Jesus had no such fanfare and no immediate communication. No broadcast was possible. No heralds were sent out. And the emotion or emotional reaction was only felt by a very few who were present. But in the Gospel of Mark, as we reach its conclusion, along with the other three Gospels, you see an announcement of the death and the resurrection of King Jesus. But this announcement did not span over the entire globe in one evening. This announcement spans over the entire globe in every single time. Every generation receives the announcement that the king was dead and the king rose again. And that's what we read starting in Mark chapter 15, starting at verse 42. Please follow with me. This is what it says. And when the evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. 
Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb. For trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. It was 3 p.m. on Friday afternoon when Jesus had died. The Jewish Sabbath began at 6 p.m. So from Friday night throughout the day on Saturday, no Jews were allowed to work And that means that unless someone acted fast and courageously, Jesus' dead, naked body would be hanging on the cross throughout the weekend, rotting in the sun, and being picked at by the crows and the vultures. This was not a fitting state for the body of the Son of God, the King of the world. And then something amazing happened. A man named Joseph of Arimathea injected himself into the situation. Verse 43 tells us that he was a member of the council, a respected member of the council, presumably the Sanhedrin, the same council who had just sentenced Jesus to death. So here, Joseph who was also looking for the kingdom of God, who had just witnessed the king being killed, and against all advice and going against the tide of his colleagues among the Jewish leadership, sought to dignify Jesus through his burial. Right after his colleagues had heaped the greatest shame upon him. It was a remarkable act of courage. Even more so because he had nothing to gain and everything to lose. Jesus was dead. The other guys had won. In the interest of self-preservation, Joseph should have just blended back into the group But Jesus' own valor encouraged his valor. His resolve encouraged Joseph's resolve. And in the same way, Jesus' valor encourages our valor. And his resolve encourages our resolve to risk, to be bold, to do the right thing, to keep standing and seeking the kingdom of God. And so Joseph went to Pilate And he risked his own standing to ask for the body of the Lord Jesus as preparations were being made in that little short window before the Sabbath began. And the details of Mark's account are brief but telling. And they point to one specific reality. 
Mark is going to great lengths to show that Jesus really was dead. Verse 44 tells us that Pilate was surprised to hear that he had died already, so much so that he asked for the centurion to verify. The centurion would have been an expert on such matters. They crucified a lot of people. The expert came back and relayed that he was really dead. Pilate was the legal officer, and in acknowledging such, his word testified that Jesus was legally dead. Joseph had asked for the body, and verse 45 says that he was given a corpse. Jesus was dead. And as he brought him to the grave and wrapped him in the linen shroud, up close and personal, he would have seen that Jesus was dead. Verse 47 tells us that Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. There were eyewitnesses to the fact that Jesus was dead. Expert evaluation, legal declaration, eyewitness account. Mark makes it a point to communicate it to me and to you and to all across the globe through all time that we could see that the Son of God, King Jesus, had indeed died. Now this is important because throughout history there have been various theories to try to explain away the work of the cross and the miracle of the resurrection. Some have claimed that it wasn't really Jesus on the cross that day. Or maybe others have claimed that it was Jesus on the cross, but it wasn't Jesus who was seen later. Some have claimed that the body was stolen away, that he still remained dead. And others said that Jesus didn't really die. He was just nearly dead. And thus his resurrection was no resurrection at all. It was merely a resuscitation. And the list goes on. But Mark makes it a point to show us all that the sacrifice for sins had been made. The curtain was torn in two. The centurion who witnessed it up close and personal said, surely this man was the son of God and the body of Jesus was laid in the grave. Jesus had died that day. Saturday was the Sabbath for the Jews. They rested but there was anything but rest for those who were the followers of Jesus. It's the unspoken and unwritten certainty that you would see here in Mark. For on Saturday, those who had believed that Jesus was the king, that Jesus was the Messiah, that Jesus was the son of God, as he had said, for them, Saturday would have meant that they were in the valley of despair. Think about it. They'd left their jobs to follow him. They'd left their families to be part of his family. They had left behind their old lives in search of a new life. They leveraged everything, and now he was dead. The dream had died with him. But just as Mark gave great detail to communicate that Jesus had really died, so too he gives great detail to show us that Jesus really did rise from the dead. Look with me at chapter 16. It says in verse 1 that when the Sabbath had passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Now it's really interesting when you look at your Bible, you see that in verse 47 of the previous chapter, just the very previous verse, Mark mentioned the full names of these two women, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph. They saw where he was laid. So it would be quite natural for him to say, and on the first day of the week, they, 
or the women got up and went to where he was laid so that they would anoint him. It's, it's really peculiar for him to mention their full names again when he had just mentioned it a few words earlier. Why would he do that? Well, he did it to emphasize that this was not just sort of some general rumor that people saw an empty tomb. There were two very specific people, Mary and Mary. This was not mere legend. This was a historical account with witnesses. And then comes the big announcement, the climax account of the book and of human history to this point. It says in verse 4, looking up that they saw the stone had been rolled back and it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Jesus had risen just as he told them. They shouldn't be surprised. Jesus told them. Perhaps they didn't believe him. More likely, they didn't have a category to understand resurrection. But Jesus told them. Jesus told them in Mark chapter 8. He told them in Mark chapter 9. He told them in Mark chapter 10. And if he told them just those three times recorded, he probably actually told them a whole lot more than that. I will die, but after three days I will rise again. I will die, but after three days I will rise again. I will die, but after three days I will rise again. But on that day... The women weren't going to the tomb expecting a resurrection. You might have thought that somewhere along the line they said, hey, remember that thing that he said? It's actually Sunday. Maybe we should go down there and check it out to see if he was actually telling the truth. But they weren't expecting a resurrection. They were going to anoint a corpse. The disciples weren't hiding. They didn't expect a resurrection. And the point is that the resurrection of Jesus was as unbelievable for those people back then as it is for many people today. But these were the eyewitnesses. Afterward, there were many more eyewitnesses. It tells us throughout the New Testament that Jesus appeared to hundreds of people. And his disciples would go on in the rest of their lives and proclaim this resurrection all the way to the point of costing them their own lives. Jesus really did rise from the dead. Robert Russell writes, I loved our Easter pageant. He said, one night I sat behind a five-year-old boy who was enthralled. And when the crucifixion scene took place, he got real quiet. But then Jesus came back from the grave and there was a song of celebration and his eyes lit up. He looked at his mother and said, he's alive, mom, he's alive. And he began to clap and he hugged his mother around the neck. It was fun to see somebody understand the resurrection for the first time. He goes on to write, I told that story to a youth minister at another church and he said, well, I want to tell you what happened at our church. He said, we showed a cartoon video of the crucifixion and the resurrection to our kindergarten students. And as I was watching the kids when Jesus was buried, one little boy who knew the story pretty well, with all the confidence, turned to his little buddy and said, he's dead now, but he'll be back. (laughs) I remember a Another story a man told one sleepy afternoon when my son was five years old, we drove past a cemetery together. And noticing a large pile of dirt beside a newly excavated grave, he pointed and said, look, dad, one got out. (laughs) 
He said, I laughed, but now every time I pass a graveyard, I'm reminded of the one who got out. Jesus really did it. He rose from the dead just as he told them he would do. And the implications of that resurrection are much more far-reaching than we can comprehend. Here's just a couple of them. Jesus' resurrection means that he really is the king. He really is who he said that he is. You remember Jesus' announcement at the very beginning of the book. Mark has this big theme that's woven all throughout. There is a king and a kingdom, and Jesus is the king, and the kingdom is God's. Mark 1.15, Jesus' first words. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And throughout the book, Jesus' teachings, his miracles, his authority displayed that he really is the king. The Jesus who healed the sick is not just a helping hand. He's the king. The Jesus who calmed the storm is not just a friend. He's the king. The Jesus who challenged the religious leaders of the day was not just a rebel. He is the king. And the Jesus who rose from the dead is not just someone to take lightly. He's the king. And this is why it says in verse 8 that the women, upon talking to the angel and seeing where the resurrection occurred, fled trembling, for astonishment had seized them. This is the right kind of fear and reverence that comes when you realize that Jesus Christ is the king. Have you bent the knee to the king? Or are you still the king of your own life? The resurrection means that Jesus is who he really says that he is. He's the king over the entire world. He's the king over you. He's the king over me. I want to invite you to bend the knee, to surrender to him, to follow him as your king today. The resurrection also means that the satisfaction for sin is complete. When a prisoner fulfills his sentence, the law of the land has no more hold on him for the penalty. Jesus fulfilled the sentence and the punishment for sin And God was satisfied. Jesus came to earth on a mission to forgive sin so that you and me would spend eternity with him and be spared from eternal judgment for those sins if we put our faith in him. One author says it this way. Here's the gospel. You are more sinful than you ever dared to believe. And you're more loved than you ever dared to hope. Paul says it this way in Ephesians 1, 7. In him, being Jesus, we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Have you been forgiven? The resurrection shows that the work of Jesus was sufficient to forgive sins, even your sins. I want to invite you to receive forgiveness. Today, you need but reach out and ask for it in faith. Faith in Jesus. And it will be given to you. The resurrection of Jesus means that he really is the king. It means that The satisfaction for sin has been made. The resurrection for Jesus also means that we will be resurrected as well. 
First Thessalonians 4.14 says, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And that's why he can write in 1 Corinthians 15, Oh, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The end of the story is not the grave. Eternal life awaits. And that compels hope and astounding freedom for those who have put their faith in Christ. Will you have eternal life? Will you? Jesus offers it to you. And I invite you to take hold of it by putting your faith in him. Lastly, Jesus' resurrection means that you will have a perfect life in eternity. I want a perfect life. I really would love to have a perfect life. It's not possible here on earth, but I can't wait until the day where we can take hold of it. Mental, physical, emotional, spiritual wholeness will be the reality for those who rise again to eternal life with Jesus. If you struggle with regret, you will be guilt-free. If you struggle with physical pain, you will never experience that pain again. If you are lonely, you will have perfect relationships. If you are insatiably curious, your curiosities will be satisfied. A perfect life forever. When the French Impressionist painter Auguste Renoir was confined to his home during the last decade of his life. Henri Matisse was nearly 28 years younger than him, and the two great artists were dear friends and frequent companions. Matisse visited him daily, and Renoir, almost paralyzed by arthritis, continued to paint in spite of his infirmities. He had to hold his brush between his thumb and his index finger, and as he painted, students often heard him crying out in pain. And one day, Matisse watched the elder painter work in his studio, fighting torturous pain with each brush stroke. And he blurted out, Auguste, why do you continue to paint when you are in such agony? And Renoir said, The pain passes, but the beauty remains. If we were to speak to Jesus on the resurrection morning, he might have said the same thing. The pain of the cross has passed, but the beauty remains. The beauty of a new creation the beauty of an army of disciples that spans millennia, the beauty of a kingdom established in the hearts of his people, all of this remains. But it may be that you're going through pain just now and you can't see an end to that pain. Can you trust that out of the pain will come a beauty that will last forever? The resurrection proves it. The resurrection guarantees it. I want to invite you to give your pain to God and ask him to show you its beauty because the resurrection means that you, despite your pain today, will have a perfect life someday in eternity. Jesus rose from the dead proving that he really is the king who forgives sins. 
And the Gospel of Mark ends with a bit of an unsatisfactory response, at least immediately. The original manuscripts of Mark end at verse 8. Many of your Bibles probably indicate that. The rest is probably an editorial edition. But it's an unsatisfactory ending. He ended abruptly. And he did it on purpose. And I think he did it on purpose to compel us to think about our response to the resurrected king. This is what it says in verse 7 and 8. The angel is talking to the two women. And he says to them, but go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. The angel told them to go and tell but they fled and said nothing. What? They just witnessed the greatest of all miracles. A resurrected king. And they said nothing? Fear and astonishment had taken hold. And they said nothing. At least in the immediate future. I mean, that's not what you would expect. You would expect overwhelming joy. You would expect immediate obedience. You would expect shouting from the mountaintops. But Mark says that they said nothing. I think he did that to help us to consider how our response is to the resurrected king. Because many of you have received forgiveness from this king Many of you have experienced the benefits of the cross and the empty tomb. Many of you have witnessed the work of God in your life. Many of you have received hope for your future. Many of you have received inexplicable joy for living. Many of you have experienced the resurrection of the King Jesus. How do you respond? Do you say nothing? Or do you let the world know that Jesus rose from the dead and it proves that he really is the king who forgives sins? This morning, I want to leave you with a charge that Jesus himself gives. He gives it to his disciples then and he gives it to his disciples now. He gives it to you. This is at the halfway point of this Gospel of Mark in chapter 8. And it helps us to see what we should do and what we should expect if you follow a resurrected King Jesus. It says this in Mark 8, 31, that he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing the disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, here's the charge. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous generation and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in glory, the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Don't be one who experiences the resurrected king and says nothing. But proclaim it. Jesus rose from the dead. 
and he proves that he really is the king who forgives sins. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus was indeed satisfactory for our sins and for the sins of the world. God, we thank you that you apply it to us in grace and grace so generous. We thank you for the eyewitness accounts of the death and burial and resurrection of the Lord, which only further emboldens our faith. And we thank you for the benefits that his resurrection means for us. God, I pray for those in our midst today who have yet to put their faith in Jesus. Would today be the day where they bend the knee to the king? I pray today, Lord, for those who have known the benefits of this resurrection for some time, that you would embolden us all the more to proclaim faithfully the benefit that this King Jesus bestows to us. And as you save more men and women and boys and girls and transform us more into the likeness of your son, to you be much glory and honor and praise. Amen and amen.